Hello and welcome to another episode of History Hack. Zach on presenting duties today and I've got Merrin with me. Merrin, how are you doing? I'm all right, Mr Zach. I'm not doing too bad at all. The sun is not shining, but it's okay. We'll get there eventually. Summer, I am assured, is on its way and until it arrives, you know, just keep my head there, keep them busy. Sounds good. Sounds good. I personally, I'm quite pleased that summer hasn't arrived because then it means that hay fever season hasn't arrived. So on a purely selfish level, I'm quite happy about that. But enough about my medical issues, because folks aren't tuning in for that rubbish. Who have we got on with us today? Because this is going to be an absolute stonker. Zach, today we have Professor Maria Haywood joining us uh, from the University of Southampton. Maria is a clothes historian. She specialises in um, the ancient and early modern periods, and she's written a number of books on fashion in the Tudor courts, particularly, including Rich Apparel, Clothing and the Law, Henry, Henry VIII's England, and Dress at the Court of King Henry VIII. Maria, welcome. How are you? Are you well? Well, I'm well, thank you. And thank you for that lovely welcome. It's so nice to see both of you. Ah, good to see you too. Good to see you too. Let's uh, dive straight in then and, and set the scene for our listeners. What kind of importance is attached to clothing in this period? Because as the title of one of your books suggests, there are laws on what people can and can't wear during this time, aren't there? Yes, there are. Um, the government is keen to regulate what people wear, and in particular, they're keen to regulate what men wear. Um, and in that sense, I think that's one of the points that always strikes me as different to now. You know, the emphasis is on very much male clothing, um, men as the head of the household, men holding all of those key positions in society. And the idea was very much to ensure that you dressed to your status and your income and that you did not dress above it and so as a consequence it meant that the uh, your contemporaries who'd be able to read your clothing would be able to look at you and know whether you're a member of the nobility professional classes the mercantile elite for instance you know your your status in society should be apparent from your appearance that makes a lot of sense it brings order to society if nothing else at a time when we don't have sort of you know, the kind of um, stability and order that we think of today in society. So as a historian, while you're looking at clothing, um, what kind of insights do you get immediately from, from seeing what, what someone's wearing? Um, you can get a lot of insights. So um, in particular, obviously you get a sense of their status. Um, you can also get um, information about their religious outlook. Obviously, in that sense, Henry's reign sees the break with Rome. Um, but if we look, for instance, at men's hat badges, um, we can see on there that they are proclaiming all sorts of things about their religious perspectives, their intellectual concerns. Um, in particular, if you look at the hat badges on some of um, Holbein's uh, sitters, such as, say, Sir Henry Guilford, so in that sense, clothing can stress those sorts of things to you. Um, you also can see um, the difference between sort of older men are very keen to stress their place in society by what they wear. There's a degree of gravitas to what they wear. Not surprisingly, younger men are keen, are usually more fashionably dressed than their, their fathers and, than, and uncles. Um, and so that's where we can start to see changes in fashion occurring. So there's a definite sense of um, the different generations are expressed. Um, equally, we get a sense of individuals who are, say, professional by their um, by their training. So doctors, lawyers, they are not only emerging as an important group in society now, but also you can you can tell them by what they wear. They tend to gravitate towards black. They tend to wear a long gown. You know, it, it is going to be that sort of this group of professional men are becoming distinct. And in fact, if you look at the Holbein painting of Henry and the barber surgeons, you can see them all. In, so this is the group of medical men who are the two companies are being joined at this point, the barbers and the surgeons, and they're all there in their official sort of, you know, trust me, I'm a doctor Tudor outfit. So do you get people trying to push the boundaries and sort of blur the distinction and dress up just that slight bit more to look a little bit more important than they really are? Yes, you do. And it, perhaps it's no surprise that it's the group in the middle that are the most keen to look as though they belong higher up in society. So it's that group around the gentry um, and the knightly class where they're keen to look 
um, better, um, more as more more successful than than they are actually. Yes, very much so. And not surprisingly, when people maybe are sort of a little less well off, they've had some financial setbacks. Equally, they're very the one thing you probably would not retrench on is your clothes if you can possibly avoid it, because you want to still sell the idea that you belong to the gentry or or the aristocracy. I, I love this idea that just by looking at someone's clothes, I mean, they say you shouldn't judge a book by, by its cover, but I love the, the fact that then there was um, a, a natural acceptance of the fact that having your portrait painted meant you could establish your position through your clothing. Mm -hmm. I, I quite like a bit of Holbein and <laughs> the, the ambassadors. So yes. you've got Jean de Donville and, and Georges de Selve. And on the left, Jean, he's the French ambassador and he's he's in his finery with I think it's links on his on coming through yes, on his silk. It is. Yes. And then on the right hand side of the picture, you've got the complete contrast because Georges is in like a cleric's really somber outfit. And even if you know nothing about the painting or the era, you can tell they were doing different jobs. Yes. Can't you? So Absolutely. When, so, so when we come back to the, the the really really famous um Holbein portrait of Henry was that I mean okay he's the king we can see he's the king it's the archetypal picture of Henry but is that how he would have dressed all the time yes and no so I think it's worth remembering that Henry probably would have changed his clothes several times during the course of the day dependent on what he was doing so if he was going hunting and riding he had specific clothes for that um, they were predominantly wool and in particular a lot of his hunting clothes were green um, whereas if he was meeting you know say the French ambassador he might well have been looking just as you would see him in that painting. Um, and then if, for instance, he was um, participating in a mask in the evening, he would be wearing his costume that had been supplied by the rebel's office. So, um, so what we see in that Holbein painting is definitely indicative of the quality of the clothes, the quantity of layers, the amount of jewellery, the types of cloth of gold, the, the, the fur, all of those sorts of things. The one difficulty with that painting is that um, both the, the that sort of the full length version that was created for the Whitehall um, mural, um, it then gets copied and repeated. So you see the same set of clothes cropping up in all of the different versions of that. So it actually gives us a much more limited view of Henry's wardrobe than it was in reality. And he had a much more varied wardrobe than that painting suggests, both in terms of garment type, colour, um, colour combinations, all of those sorts of things. So, as you say, it is um, a sort of shorthand for what Henry had in his wardrobe, and he definitely had things like that, but he had a lot more. Mm. And what kind of role does colour play in all of this? Because one of the things that I know your research kind of talks about is the fact that certain people can't afford certain colours for obvious reasons because of dyes and so on, but others aren't allowed to wear certain colours. So talk us through that kind of hierarchy of what these, these different things mean. Absolutely. So purple is the colour in question that they name in the sumptuary law that is specifically um, related to the monarch and his immediate family. Um, and they're very specific. It is purple on silk. And so when you asked me earlier on about how people tried to sort of wiggle their way around the law, um, you could get away with violet wool because that's not purple silk, but you're still wearing a colour that has associations with royalty. Also, the legislation specifies that you're not allowed to wear it on the outer layers of your clothing. So as a consequence, people would try and have violet or purple linings because of course again they don't contravene the law in the absolute letter of it and this of course is one of the things that's fascinating about these um, restrictions because basically if you specify something people can't do they find a way around it um, and they are notoriously hard to enforce so purple is the sort of designator of royalty um, but other colours are mentioned, so they are keen to uh, limit access to um, blue, uh, sorry, blue and scarlet silk uh, velvets. In particular, these are then restricted to the Knights of the Garter, so the sort of chivalric elite. Um, whereas in contrast, black is one of these colours that is um, difficult and expensive to achieve at this point because it's usually a double dyed process using expensive dye stuffs but it's the colour that most 
people aspire to have in their wardrobe, you are likely to find it pretty much across the social spectrum. Um, but it's then a question of you know, how new it might be, for instance, um, how and black also fades and changes color. So for the for the wealthy, you would buy it new regularly or have it re-dyed, whereas for those with a little less money, they'll be wearing theirs even now it's not quite as black as it used to be. <laughs> So, so there are various issues with, with colour like that. Um, I suppose the up, at the opposite end of the spectrum, it's worth noting that just because people lower down in society, this doesn't mean that they have sort of grey, drab um, wardrobes. They, they don't. Um, there's, um, and if you look at the evidence of wills for individuals sort of down in the sort of lower social groups like yeomen, husbandmen and, and labourers, you do find that there's, there's colour appearing um, and it might be that it's restricted to accessories, it might be that it's trimmings, but that yes, colour sort of permeates the whole of the Tudor Tudor wardrobe, but it might well be that you will get less of the really strong, expensive reds, for instance, um, lower down I'm, society. I'm, I'm digging back, and I, I have to dig a long way, into a primary school exercise where I think there was something to do with sheep urine and woad or or how we get the colours, and, and we don't have fixatives. So, so on, on a very basic level, the the ability to put colour into clothing is something that we're still exploring at this point. Is that right? Um, no, no. The dyeing industry is very sophisticated by this is point. It? Yes, absolutely. And um, it's heavily regulated. Um, so in terms of what you're referring to, um, in terms of woad, yes, in order to be able to dye with woad, you need to be able to ferment it to um, yeah. make the dye essentially into something that will actually fix onto the fibre. And as you say, you use old urine to create the woad vat, which is one of the reasons why dyeing is a very smelly occupation. Um, it is prestigious in as much that it's highly skilled, but it's not the sort of business you want right next door to your house. And so, you know, you start to <laughs> that the Tudors are quite starting to regulate where dyers can work because obviously you want them down river from you um, in that sense. Um, so no, but um, the, the sort of the, there's um, a, a group of um, dyes such as, as woad um, and indigo, which is starting to come into Europe. Um, equally uh, madder, cochineal, kermes. Um, these dyes are very fast, they're expensive, the gradation of price there. So woad, which is produced in England is um, moderately cheap, which is one of the reasons why we don't get much blue in the king's wardrobe. So going back to Zach's question, blue is a color that is very much associated with apprentices, uh, with servants livery. Um, the one time that we see um, the Tudors, uh, the early Tudor monarchs wearing blue is for what would have been termed as days of mourning. So things like Maundy Thursday, this is where the king would wear blue to denote his piety. But at other times, it's a colour that's associated with people a little lower down the social order and he wouldn't and he wouldn't wear it. You mentioned Europe there. Are we seeing European influences, not only in fabrics, but also in styles coming across to Britain at this point? Yes, absolutely. You know, Henry is very keen to present his court as a European court, a court that's on par with those of Francis I of France, Charles V of Spain, and who's also Holy Roman Emperor. So yes, he's, you know, he is very much looking at these other courts. Um, and if we look at his clothing accounts, for instance, there are references to pieces being in the Almain style, so in the German style, so those amazing slashed sort of um, hose that you see for the lands connect, that sort of thing. Um, he, he's wearing some of those in the 1510s, for instance. Um, we also get things that are described as being in the Spanish style, both during his marriage to Catherine of Aragon, but also later, they're there in the 1540s, for instance. Um, we know that he's interested in what's going on in France. There's a sort of very wonderful comparative moment where he's comparing himself to Francis I. So, so yes, the, the, these sort of ideas about what is desirable and fashionable in clothing is sort of circulating around these elite courts and the English court is definitely looking towards what's going on in Europe and will be influenced by, by, styles, by styles there, absolutely. 
Is there anything that's absolutely sort of off the menu when it comes to either a particular star or a particular fashion that you know, no self-respecting Tudor, whatever their social status yeah. is going to touch, be it a particular colour or be it a particular um, style or, or um, what's the word? Accessory. Yeah. yeah. Uh, probably not. There's a lovely um, suggestion by the time we get to the sort of a, a early in Elizabeth's reign where we're getting a number of writers who are commenting on um, the unfortunate English preoccupation with fashion. And one of the things they say is that um, the English can't make their minds up and they're a mingle mangle of everything that comes from Europe. Probably the worst of all examples to give you this really rather gaudy <laughs> look. So, um, and certainly when Erasmus comes to um, the English court, he comments on the rather ostentatious use of gold and jewelry, in particular big rings and big chains. And this is the men again, of course, that are doing this. So he thinks they're definitely a bit on the flashy side compared to um, those, you know, sophisticated Italians and European courts that he's been to. But that's really interesting because the English psyche is that you wear your wealth, isn't it? That's that, they're doing that very deliberately. So yes. are they just completely out of the loop, or is it is it just something that's seen as quite English inverted commas in this time? What what's the kind of reasoning between this kind of disconnect between what they think is great and what everyone else is doing? <laughs> Um, I, I think possibly in that sense, you can actually see that, say, Francis I is, is wearing quite a lot of his wealth when you look at his portraits. I think the big difference between the Italians in particular and, and England is that in the um, Italians invest their money very much into the sort of furnishings for the home. So there would be your displays of gold and silver plate on the buffet, expensive myolica, expensive textiles for the home. And so if anyone came into your home, they would be under no doubt out about how wealthy you were but you wouldn't necessarily adorn yourself in lots and lots of jewellery um, again it would come back to the fact that people would read your clothes and be able to draw uh, conclusions from you know what you were wearing so for instance in Venice um, the sort of male elite of course this is a republic the male elite they all essentially dress the same but within those rules you know there is wiggle room for trying to just show off that you are just as equal as all of your fellow senators by you know the, the quality of the triple height velvet that you're wearing for instance or the size of the pattern of your damask so as with all these things you can sort of push the boundaries um, so yes, I, they just do ostentation in a different way. It's, um, but it's, I, I think this is because is some of this generational, not only the, the style, but the, the, the impress. I mean, it hasn't just happened overnight, has it? How has fashion changed over the period of a generation to get to this point then? Oh, you mean so in comparison to, say, Henry VII, for instance? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so it's interesting, if you look at Henry VII's accounts, um, he buys... Um, a lot of clothes um, and he like his son makes use of cloth of gold uh, purple velvet um, for the occasion of his marriage uh, the marriage of his son Arthur to the Infanta of Spain Catherine of Aragon you know he has pairs of orange shoes um, so he, he exactly he can dress the part when he wants to I think the difference between Henry the seventh and Henry the eighth is Henry the seventh is very strategic in the displays of opulence so they are for things like this wedding which is a huge diplomatic achievement um, and for key religious festivals um, but not every day um, his wardrobe is opulent but on other occasions understated he certainly doesn't skimp on it um whereas you know henry the seventh henry the eighth rather sorry is um his is more flamboyant um and he does spend a lot on his wardrobe and and is there any style that sorry is, is there any style they're avoiding at the same time um, is there no, so what we see in terms of the stylistic change between Henry VII and Henry VIII is that the garments remain essentially the same. So for men, they're wearing the doublet and hose and a gown. Um, in For Henry VII, it's worth thinking that, of course, he is older as a monarch, and obviously towards the end of his life, he's, he's not particularly well. Um, and he is very much typified by that long gown, which covers... Um, the doublet and hose pretty much. 
Um, whereas for Henry VIII, he wears a gown um, throughout the reign, but it's much shorter, it's sort of knee length, um, and it's always worn open. Again, if we go back to that, the Holbein image, um, it is in exactly, it is open, and so you can see the doublet and hose underneath. Um, and so he wants to show off the layers that are underneath. And as you say, there's a lot more swagger about the way that Henry VIII wears his clothes as well. And he's he's a bigger man as well. And so there's a really impressive sense of when he stands before you. Um, I'm doing my, be my best swagger here with my hands on my hips. I don't have the beard for it, but I can do the, do the archetype. Well, I am swaggering. I am swaggering. Exactly. Um, and um, there's a comment about when people saw that painting that they were abashed and annihilated. So it was intended to be imposing. So in other words, to dominate the visitors to that room, even if the king wasn't present. Um, now, this is actually picking up on an ancient Roman trope about how painting should work, but that in itself is also interesting. You know, it is designed to be impressive. Is that something to do with the, the, the way they, they show the upper body being strong? Yes, uh, exactly. And of course, Holbein messes around with Henry's proportions in that painting to make him look bigger. So he yeah. lengthens his legs um, and he's, and, it's, um, and you know, and the, the nature of, um, clothing for men sort of by the 1530s and 40s is the emphasis is all on the shoulders so that they you get this sense of that very strong upper body um and of course henry was tall so he has that sense of he's he's a tall imposing man as a young man if we look at his armor he is lithe and athletic as we see as he gets older that body shape changes and then with the multiple layers that the wealthy tudor male can afford he is a very imposing figure, but it is top, top heavy. It's all in the all in the shoulders in the way they're presented. And isn't that tied into kind of perceptions of masculinity? So, you know, the emphasis of quite muscular legs is tied in with what it means to be manly during this period. I'm guessing the kind of the big kind of shoulder pad, almost sort of 80s style um, look that we would now, as we would now look at it, kind of an 80s style shoulder pad thing. It's all tied in with manliness, inverted commas. Yes, and I think it is just that is the particular element there that you get, as you say, the emphasis is all on the the upper upper body and and the the, the shoulders. Um, the cut of the gown um, makes you look bigger across across the shoulders, um, and of course the combination of that you know, you would have had on a doublet, possibly a jerkin, and then the gown over the top. So the, there's layers as well as um, it's not all Henry um, in terms of that sense of um, bulk. Do, but say, do, um, sorry. No, I was going to say, do we still have cod? We, we have cod pieces here, don't oh, we? Oh yes, we do. We do, and that's I think another reason. Um, so, the cod piece's primary function is to cover the front opening in the hose, but obviously it develops in a very distinctive way during the late fifteenth and early sixteenth century. Um, and, and I think that's another reason why we see um, the gown being worn open as it is for, for Henry VIII, that for him the cod piece is an integral part of the hose and of course that is then displayed um, between the skirts of the double. Quite so we've talked a lot. Sorry I was going to say it's quite a fashion statement to have a cod piece isn't it? It is yes mm. absolutely absolutely and it's very interesting in terms we of should, when that's painted. We should bring them back. We should bring back cod pieces. But and Zach's shaking his head violently here. I think a cod piece is a great thing to have. I, you know, and never mind just the men having them. To have, honestly, for, for so many reasons, cod pieces are the way to go. Merritt, I'm sure we could put together an argument that effectively buying a Porsche 911 after a certain <laughs> point in your life is the modern day equivalent of a cod piece, frankly. I had one of those. <laughs> Not surprising. Sorry, Zach, I interrupted. You go. No, don't worry. So we've talked about royal men a great deal. Let's talk about the ladies at court, the women in Henry's life. What kinds of things are women wearing during this period? Um, the, the female wardrobe is relatively simple in terms of the garments. So there is the gown, um, which is the main garment. Um, and that, at the beginning of this period, is worn with a separate kirtle. Um, however, um, as we progress through, uh, sometimes we see the gown with a, with a four part. So in essence, that's the contrasting area that you can see at the front of the skirt. Um, a lot of emphasis is placed on the sleeves. 
Uh, so you might have a pair of tight fitted sleeves um, that you could have over sleeves attached to. Um, and um, as Merrin will know, Holbein produces two portraits of Jane Seymour, for instance, that are almost the same. The difference being the treatment of the sleeves that are attached to that gown. So yeah. one set of sort of embroidered linen, the others much, much more opulent. And, and ruffs, what's the purpose of ruffs? for men and women? Do they have different purposes? Um, they do, but we don't really have roughs in this period. Um, so what we're just starting to see is by the 1540s, um, especially for Henry, we've got the high neck shirt. Um, and for some of the women, we'll see the high neck sort of smock and you'll see a little integral ruffle that's sort of stitched into the, the neck band. That's it, yeah. Exactly. Um, that will evolve into what becomes the rough sort of maybe by the sort of 15, sort of 60s, 70s, 80s, and when they become a separate item that can then be laundered, starched and set into all of those amazing shapes that you see in the sort of Elizabethan and early Jacobean portraits. So, so are women told, in the same way that there's regulation for colour, are, are they told what to wear or are the ladies at court able to, to establish their own traits, perhaps to align with, with who that, you know, suitors and, and things? Um, that's one of the things that's very interesting about Henry VIII's sumptuary law, um, that women are mentioned in the first legislation he um, passes, but it just says this doesn't apply to women. And they don't get mentioned at all in the other three. So in essence, women can wear what they like, with the caveat that it is likely that that is going to be governed to a certain extent by what their husband, father, son, can afford unless of course they're widows in which case you know they control their own money and they're going to have a greater degree of freedom over what they choose to wear and whether they yeah. stay in mourning for a long period or not yeah. so um women have a degree of, of freedom which is which is nice um in that sense they're not regulated by their husbands but there would have been a sense that if women were seen to be dressing way outside their, their social rank, um, that would have been, I suspect, regarded slight, with slight disapproval because it would suggest that the, the man was not in control of his household. So, you know, that our paterfamilias is not <laughs> controlling um, his women folk as potentially to, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that kind of brings me on to something that I wanted to ask about kind of what we see in terms of different um, queens during this, during Henry's reign and different styles, because you talk about Tudor fashion and most people will either think of Holbein's Henry VIII or they'll think of the famous picture of Anne Boleyn, which is um, for what we might perceive as for the time being quite risque in terms of the low cut nature of the gown. So do you see transitions from different wives to different styles? Um, so, yes, so um, it's interesting that um, one of the things that's often sort of said about Anne is that she uh, pursued a much more pro-French look in her appearance, in part because of uh, spending time in Europe uh, for her education, and also, of course, it allowed her to set herself apart from Catherine of Aragon. Um, so that is an important consideration in terms of how you wish to dress. Um, we certainly see, for instance, that Jane Seymour, when she's setting up her household, she is being offered the services of a cup of two of the uh, daughters of Honor Lyle, who is currently in Calais at the time. And um, they're informed very firmly that you know, she will take one of them, but not with her French fashion. She must be dressed in the English style. So it very much suggests that Jane was keen to sort of push back against what might have been associated more with Anne, to, again, to distinguish herself. So I think the, as you say, Henry's wives, one of, the own, one of the ways in which they could establish their own sense of identity is going to be through the style of clothing that they're associated with, how they wish the women in their household to dress. Absolutely. Um, and I think it's interesting that, as you mentioned, with the that sort of quite low square neckline that we can see for these gowns. Um, if in some of the portraits, um, so for instance, if we think about the portrait of Holbein's lady with a, a squirrel, um, 
that actually shows that the, there is the low square neckline, but it's infilled with a very fine linen partlet. So sometimes they're not quite as low as they look, or rather they are low, but the, there isn't as much chest on display as it were. Um, and in comparison to say the, the sort of later Stuart period, these are really very decorous necklines. So you mentioned children there. Are, are, are children wearing different clothes to express themselves in different ways? Are they being dressed in different clothes for different reasons? And that is a really interesting question. Um, and we don't have a huge amount of um, evidence in particular for Elizabeth when young, because, um, you know, Anne Boleyn is executed when Elizabeth is such a small child that um, we get references from her governess to Henry saying that Elizabeth is short of clothes, she's being neglected. So um, it, that is an interesting question. Um, in terms of um, Mary, we have more information in terms of how she dresses and we can see, dependent on when she's in and out of favour with her father, we can see how much money she has. And I think that is actually what's interesting about the two of them, that obviously at the points when, um, you know, they're both declared illegitimate, for instance, um, they're not at court as much, they aren't getting as much money at the points when, for instance, um, Catherine Parr is keen to reconcile Henry with his daughters um, for one of the Christmas celebrations, for instance, she orders a particular cloth of silver, which she, Mary, Elizabeth and Edward all wear. And so that presents a real unity between Henry's last wife and, and his children. So quick one then, what, how long do clothes last? How long do they make them last? And what happens to the clothes when they go in and out of fashion or, or aren't necessarily appropriate? Um, so it, so it, it depends, but certainly, for instance, with Henry VIII, um, he has a um, very practical solution on how to manage his wardrobe. He gives his clothes away. And we have lots of documentation of who gets given what. Um, and, in, and it can be a whole range of individuals. So, for instance, when he meets Francis... Um, for the field of the cloth of gold, for instance, there is there are a number of um, garments that Henry gives to various members of the French household as sort of diplomatic gifts. But each year he just gives things away. Um, and this has the added virtue of clearing out his closet, um, literally. Um, and of course, giving people what would have been seen as the ultimate sign of um, royal approval that you've been given a piece of the king's clothing. Um, now, of course, officially, you're not supposed to wear it because the sumptuary law wouldn't necessarily permit it, but the law does have the caveat in it that should the king give you permission, you can wear whatever he says you can wear. So this is why, for instance, we see, I think, Henry Guilford wearing that cloth of gold doublet, for instance. I'm not suggesting it's necessarily a perquisite for the king, but I, you know, he is the king's great friend, jousting partner and... Um, and I think that's why he's also got the sable on his gown. You know, it doesn't fit with the, his social status, but as, you know, one of the king's best friends, um, you know. Getting away um, with it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, Don't you know so who I am? <laughs> exactly. So, so Henry gets round the problem of, um, you know, having keeping things too long as it were because he gives them away and so he gets sort of extra mileage out of his clothes and it also means he has the option of um this is so he does wear some things more than once but for key occasions you do not want ambassadors saying well we've seen that before um because they do say it on occasion um in that sense it's a bit like now when they comment on whether the, the queen or someone has worn something before or not um so but darling that's so passe we've seen that such such last season <laughs> but of course you could argue that it is frugal <laughs> ah you could you could the treasury <laughs> could. is first and all that yeah <laughs> um so so for the monarch he he recycled clothes and it works very well because it can be seen as largesse um, and it works very well to sort of present the royal image. For people a little bit further down the, the social order, um, you might have your clothes refurbished, so you could have them relined, retrimmed. Um, there is a strong secondhand market for clothing. And also, if we equally we look sort of a little bit further down the social order, um, people often leave the quests of clothing because clothing was expensive in terms 
the percentage of your annual income that you'd spend on clothing then as opposed to now, you'd have spent a much higher percentage on a much smaller number of items. So you made them last. Um, and as such, you know, that's where you get, you know, these references to I leave my best doublet to so and so I leave a set of clothes to each of my daughters for instance the one that I always find very worrying is I leave the shirt that I died in you know who wants that um you know the, 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 but they have this wonderful sort of you know and, and there's this amazing hierarchy so it's my best suit my second best suit my worst suit um course as you can't see them you have no sense of what the gradations of quality are and your worst suit still might be a very nice item but it might not you, you just don't know and that's one of the difficulties with working with that sort of evidence but it's interesting they had a, a sense of what was best and what was worst amongst their clothing and the confidence that their executors were going to be able to tell which was which and make sure that the right items went yeah. to people. what did they wash them with um, it depends, which is a very Weasley answer, I know. Um, so uh, the linens, so your shirts, smocks, coifs, those sorts of things, um, would be washed as it pretty much as, as we would think, you know, you hand washing, then there would also be the option of, of bleaching, uh, because, you know, whiteness was an important marker of, of status. Um, and so, so those items could be washed. Um, for the expensive silks with metal thread and things like that, you would not wash those. Um, that is not possible. So you would have, um, A, you'd have tried to keep them clean. <laughs> so you didn't have that problem. Um, if they did get dirty, then dependent on what it was, if it was say mud from riding, um, you'd brush them, try and remove that. You could use absorbent powders to try and remove greasy stains from things. Um, you know, if things became irreparably stained, for instance, you might recut them to make them into something else. So to recycle the fabrics. So there's a lot of sort of reuse, reworking, but um, only some of the clothes would have been washable. Others certainly were not. And this is another reason mm -hmm. perfume is starting to become um, I mean, perfume has a very long history, but certainly you start to see lots of references to perfumed powders, um, perfume sort of uh, soap balls and things to keep. So to make your linens smell nice when you wash them, but also you uh, put them in uh, perfumed chests to keep them smelling fragrant. So, so in, again, in my head, I have a, a ladybird book with a picture of Henry and somebody back in my primary school days teaching me that, that, that he wore scents to cover up the smell of his leg or something like that. Does, does that ring a bell? Um, uh, well, let's put it this way. He certainly, there are references in the um, 1547 inventory was, was taken when he died. There mm. are references to bandages for his leg. Absolutely. Um, and also... Uh, one of the things that's really interesting is that there are no references to shoes in the inventory when he dies. Um, whereas during the course of his lifetime, he bought lots and lots of pairs of shoes. There's one year where he orders a 20, 120 pairs of shoes. Um, these are velvet covered and satin covered. So, you know, they're worn a couple of times and then they'd again, they'd have been passed on. Um, whereas the, the more substantial leather boots and leather shoes would have had greater wear in them um but yes i i suspect that um the, the suggestion is that yes that 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 the the opened wound on his leg would not have been pleasant so so i, I know zach's gonna ask a question so a quick one hygiene then um without being too delicate about it are ladies and gentlemen wearing underpants at this point or is this not <laughs> garment um, no, so so the main body garments are the shirt for a man and a, a shift for a woman. Um, mm -hmm. And then for women, the upper body would be shaped by a garment called a pair of bodies, yeah. which is, you know, provides shaping and, and keeps the chest <laughs> stable um, and draws you in at the waist. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, for instance, in Elizabeth's household accounts there are some references to drawers um, but they were seen as quite risque at the time um, there are some lovely um, uh, drawings of Venetian courtesans and one of the things that is seen as their absolute mark of appeal is the fact that they wear um, they wear bloomers they wear knickers yes oh, oh, okay. <laughs> very um, 
and, and this would, uh, if it's just to take a slightly light, later example, when um, Samuel Pepys thinks his wife is having an affair, he watches her when she's getting dressed to see whether she puts any knickers on, because this is clearly in his mind. The, whether she puts them on. Exactly. It sort of seems slightly counterintuitive, but, you know, it's... it's oh, lovely. You've got your knickers on, woman. Where are you going? <laughs> what are you up to? <laughs> I think that, that was definitely what he was thinking. Um, um, so whereas um, the, the shirt for men would have been, they're, they're long shirts and they would sort of, they could come down sort of to mid thigh. And so what you'd normally do is you'd pull the shirt between the legs so that that would protect the hose um, and you from the hose. And then again, that's why, you know, the, the shirt is the main body garment. Um, interestingly, though, um, a, a couple of, a sort of about a decade ago, uh, some very interesting pieces of um, sort of late medieval, early modern underwear, including what looks like a very sort of prototype sort of brassiere was found in um, a monastery in, in Austria. Um, but there aren't really examples of these um, within the Tudor um, material. So we've explored some of the, um, the, the, the finery and the, embe the embellishment that would have gone onto these garments. What about, um, not necessarily sort of serfdom, but, but coming back into ordinary society, um, what kind of clothing are we not seeing because it's not been put into portraits? What, what, what would normal people have been wearing? Um, well, they essentially they wear the same garments. So for men, it would be the doublet and hose. Um, for women, it would be a gown. The differences are really, as you say, are going to come in terms of the amount of decoration, the types of materials in particular. So if we're looking at, um, so when I looked at the wills of husbandmen and, and yeomen and labourers, um, there are far less gowns because obviously they have a lot of fabric. Um, and while they're a marker of status, they are absolutely vital to your day-to-day -day wear. Whereas obviously your hose, your shirt, your shoes, those are going to be, and your hat, of course, no well-dressed Tudor man is without a hat. Um, these are vital to your, you know, you're being able to earn your living. And so I suppose the, difference, so the differences will come in, there'll be a lot less silk. Um, and also it's interesting that, so they'll be predominantly wearing um, import, English wool, um, probably home produced linen as opposed to the expensive imported linens that the elite are wearing. Um, this isn't to say that there won't be colour, there will be some, um, but um, and in some cases there is quite a bit, but it may well be that it's slightly cheaper dye stuffs, It's there might be more blue than we were talking about, there'll definitely be um, uh, black, there may well be some things that are described as being sort of uh, sheep's colour or russet, so coloured wools that are coloured naturally, um, that don't need dyeing. Um, but just because they're sort of lower down the social order doesn't mean they don't have a sense of what's desirable, fashionable. And Style. Exactly, and that there will be so that they might have all the same accessories, as I mentioned, they just might be made of slightly um, cheaper materials. So there'd be, say, knitted bonnets rather than the velvet ones that we see in the Holbein portraits, a slightly heavier weight linen, um, yes, more wool. Um, but this doesn't mean that, again, for some of those sort of wealthier yeomen, that there might not be silk elements, um, but it might be that it might be that you just have the one, your best doublet has either silk trimmings or silk sleeves is one of the ways they get round it, that um, the body of the doublet is made of something cheaper, but the sleeves are made of something more expensive because they show through the gown. So you look like you are, you've spent more on your appearance than you actually have. And so, you know, it's just that sort of shrewd, canny, how do I make myself look like a respectable yeoman or and, 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 and sort of substantial alongside my, my neighbours? Uh, but maybe I've spent ever so slightly less to, to, to do this. Um. So, I mean, I'm really curious about your source material for all of this, because we've talked obviously about paintings, we've talked about things like wills and inventories, but you're dealing with fabrics that were the best one in the world. They weren't designed to last anything like 500 years. So how do you sort of piece all of this together in terms of working it all out? Um, so yes, um, I'm very lucky that for the Tudor period we have really rich material for Henry um, himself and the court. We have um, detailed accounts listing his clothing for 
about a third of the years of his reign and they're sort of spread across which is very helpful so we've got inventory entries and warrants ordering things so they tell you how many yards of a particular fabric and they quite often tell you what color what weight all of these sorts of things um as you say we also have the portraits um we have lots of wills that are starting to appear um but what is interesting is that um on many ways, you're right, the, the, the clothing certainly was not designed to last for 500 years, um, but there are pieces of clothing, unfortunately, none that we can categorically associate with Henry, but if we look a little more broadly, and in particular, if we look at European collections, for instance, um, we can see that there are, there's a wonderful pair of yellow silk knitted hose that are lined with a sort of chamois leather that are in Dresden, which date from the 1540s, and they are, sound very, very similar to something that is described as Henry's account. So, and they are in pristine condition. They are the most amazing yellow. And um, I'm sure Merrin will be pleased to know they have a very impressive cod piece as well. Um, and so, you know, that really gives you a sense of um, the skill of the tailor, um, the quality of the dyeing, just how well made they were. It also, you know, in this particular example, they show you how fashionable knitting was. I, I, you know, you, when knitting is sort of mentioned, it, it isn't the thing that people necessarily associate with the, the Tudor period or with high fashion in the 16th century. Um, and, and yes, the, it is definitely being worn. And so um, it is, as you say, it's a, it's a detective work because you've got to piece together all of the different types of evidence. But we're very lucky that there is some surviving clothing, not a lot, but some, um, and then we've got visual material. Um, we're so lucky again that, you know, Holbein was painting for Henry. I think our view of the Henrician court would be so different if we didn't have that amazing group of, of portraits and drawings. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and the Holbein ones in particular tell us so much. When, when um, I mean, go straight back to the ambassadors with that anamorphic skull and, 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 and all the symbology in there about what was happening at the time and internationally. So, that's a good point actually internationally do does fashion at this point tell us a lot about geopolitical boundaries trade what's happening can, can we follow that a little through the clothing yes absolutely so um you know Cromwell describes England as being an ungracious dog hole on the corner of Europe and, and very and Henry's very keen to sort of counter that and he wants his court to look as good as possible and so that's why he's keen to attract um European craftsmen like Holbein to come to his court um but yes I suppose just to give you one example um there's a group of Italian merchants known as the Bardi, um, and they are very keen to sell their wares to Henry, and most um, trade goes through the Great Wardrobe, but they realise if they bypass the Great Wardrobe, they can sell direct to the king, and their, their um, business accounts are caught, record you know, lots of payments for boat hire mule hire so they sort of follow the king around so when they arrive with their new shipment of silks hot from you know Florence and Venice and Lucca um they arrive and they make sure they get to stand right in front of him so they and you imagine them sort of unrolling them and saying would you like this one would you like that one and of course they've got a concession from the king that says if he gets first sight of their goods they don't have to pay any import duty on them um but only if he gets first choice um so here we can see his wish to get the very best of what's coming into the country, um, driving um, his sort of his financial arrangements with them. And they are very happy to exploit that as well. So you can see it's an interesting relationship between king and merchant. Um, but it shows you that those really desirable fabrics, they are all imported. They are in relatively small quantities, which adds to their scarcity and luxury. Um, and so, so yes, it is a it's this it's a luxury trade that we can see that sort of uh, driven. I'm, I'm, I'm suddenly fascinated by the import duties on fabrics and goods, and possibly different duties on on embellishments and things like that. Is that right? Um, yes, so there are books of rates that are drawn up throughout the 16th century, and there's a whole list of goods that they charge duty on coming into the country, and it's fascinating in terms of, as you say, what sorts of things, so you, and if you track them across the 16th century, you can see, you know, the, um, 
increase in particular types of silk, for instance, that are coming in or imports of hats or shoes or whatever else it might be, which of course in turn explains why then London merchants and English merchants in general get very grumpy about imports of foreign goods that are undermining their business and um the government that's it ever was money exactly plus, shows, plus shows as they say as they say let me ask one last question to before we wrap up then and it's uh it's i'm sorry it's a military historian's type of question <laughs> <laughs> but uniform during this period. Today we have this perception of uniform that kind of goes back really to um, the early 19th century in terms of using it as a status symbol. Who was wearing uniform during this period or was it actually not the done thing to wear uniform? Because people might think of kind of the um, the constables of the Tower of London and so on um, and kind of associate that with uh, the Tudor style. Is that just one of those sort of anachronistic perspectives we have or or not? Um, so uh, the Tudors had livery colours, um, green and white were the Tudor livery colours, and Henry issues livery, which in essence is uniform, to uh, his trumpeters, for instance, um, and also at times of war, um, to some of the sailors, say, on various of the king's ships, and also to royal troops. Um, in terms of uniform I think the best example in light of what you're asking is when Henry goes on campaign in 1544 to France, he dresses his whole household in red and yellow, everybody. Um, and that includes a number of the key figures within the army who are leading the different parts of it. And there's a real hierarchy between um, wool and silk and the balance of red to yellow. Um, and that is really interesting in terms of getting a sense of a unified, literally, army. Um, but yes, the other groups that you would see are the Yeomen of the Guard, um, and they have two uniforms. One is red, uh, the other is white and green, and they both have the King's initials on the front and the back and the Tudor rows. And in essence, they are essentially the forerunner of what we see at the Tower. Um, and one last example, we also start to see children, school children wearing uniform during the Tudor period. Um, Christ's Hospital um, in the City of London is the first to do this and they issue the children um, with blue coats. So it's the first of those blue coat schools. And that's where, um, again, you know, they, because they take children on their merit, not necessarily because they're of their parents' ability to um, pay to educate them. Um, and so in order to make them all look the same and not to distinguish and make those children with less money look to stand out from the others, they're all dressed the same in these blue coats. Brilliant. Maria, Maria, I don't know where to start because there are so many other questions that I now want to ask about fashion and fabric and trade and and the influence of clothing on society and politics and, and, and the way that it then cascaded through the generations. Where would you suggest that we start? Not not just with your own good books, but where, where would we look now if we wanted to find out more? Oh, that is um, a good question. Um, I think it's a combination of maybe actually I wouldn't start with a book. I think I might start, say, for instance, with um, the National Gallery um, and have a look at the paintings, go to the Tudor Gallery, because that's where you get to see the monarchs, but you get to see um, the various members of the court and sort of they have a few paintings of people sort of into that mid range. Um, and that's one of the things that's so exciting about the Tudors that we really start to see the middling sort develop and branch into um, the use of portraiture. Um, and while there are all sorts of problems with using portraits as a source, um, they also are very um, evocative and exciting and they give you a chance to see what an ensemble looks like in essence. So I think that's where I would recommend people to start because um, for me, I find it's the visual element of this which is so appealing. Um, and then once those um, portraits have inspired you, that's when I think I would move on to um, reading about them. That's a great suggestion. Maria, thank you so much. We've learned so much today, haven't we, Zach? 
Oh, it's been brilliant. It takes me right back to my uni days, actually, because Maria lectured me when I was uh, a spotty little undergraduate, uh, which, in fairness, wasn't all that long ago. Um, <laughs> but yeah, this was a, a tour de force. Thank you so much for that, Maria. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you both. <laughs>